Good evening. Welcome to a land market update. What's driving the Australian land market? My name's David Brown and I work with Home Sackett, the New South Wales or, or MLA's uh, webinar coordinators. And this here is a MLA sheep productivity and profitability webinar. For those who are joining us for the first time this evening, you'll see this control panel on the right hand side of your screen. You'll be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. If you wish to collapse that control panel to free up more space on your screen, just hit the red button, hit the same button to reinstate it. The questions box is very important. You're welcome to submit questions at any time throughout the evening. They'll be logged chronologically and our presenter this evening has kindly agreed to stay on for as long as we need to answer all the tricky questions that you may have for him. So our presenter this evening is Angus Gidley Baird of Rabobank. Angus is a senior analyst in the Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Research Team and he is responsible for research and analysis of the local and global animal protein sectors. Angus provides regular market updates on beef, sheep, meat, pork, poultry and seafood markets and he develops and writes a feature research, a feature research providing knowledge and insights on key industry issues uh, with recent reports on forward marketing in the red meat industry and value based marketing for beef. Angus is a regular public speaker at farmer and industry events and also produces podcasts as part of his role in the Rabo Research Team Communications. Angus formerly held roles of the New South Wales Farmers Association and with the Department of Food and Rural Affairs in the United Kingdom. With Angus's experience and knowledge of the topic area and backed by the information and data um, that is at his fingertips within Rabobank, he's probably very well resourced to, to, to deliver tonight's webinar and we're very appreciative that he's uh, able to come on board and, and be part of it. I'll change screen with Angus and welcome him to the webinar. Are you there, Angus? I am, David. Welcome. Am I coming through? Coming through loud and clear. Thank you. We can see your screen. You can see the screen, brilliant. All right, uh, well that's that's work, working well and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to join one of these webinars in this series. Um, it's always nice to be invited along to be able to, to talk to these things and to a range of people, uh, which I understand are covering a number of regions in Australia. As, as David alluded to, I'm with Rabobank. I'm a I'm not a banker. <laughs> I am a one of the analysts in their animal uh, their uh, Rabo research team. We've got uh, commodity analysts spanning all the different commodities and and tap into some of the global knowledge that we have around the world. Uh, and I'll I'll be leaning on that in terms of some of the information that I'm providing today. So, what I thought I'd quickly run through. And, and recognising that um, we're probably looking at about a 20 minute time frame, so um, happy to, to stay on as, as David said, as long as required at the end, um, because there's, there's bound to be uh, a, a bit of interest in some of the, the areas that we're going to touch on and happy to field any conversations about it. But uh, basically I was going to walk through uh, trying to answer the question, or at least I, I suppose delving into the question of what's driving the Australian land market at the moment. And as land producers out there, I'm sure you're all well aware of, of the, the very favourable conditions at the moment from a, a price point of view. So I'll touch on the Australian market, then have a look a little bit at the global market, and I'll provide a couple of case studies, I suppose you could call it, looking at the US market and the New Zealand market. Uh, to me, the US market is is the exciting one from an Australian point of view. Uh, the New Zealand market is one we've always got to keep a, uh, a close eye on. Our cousins ever in the Dutch, over the Dutch, um, and what they're doing over there, because obviously they're the other major supplier of lamb into that global complex. So then, to to start the picture and to 
set the scene, I suppose, and give us some context to, to what we might be looking at. And, and this is in the view of trying to create a bit of a five year or a, a short to medium term outlook on what's going on in the lamb industry that will hopefully guide you in, in some of your uh, business and, and operational decisions. But we've seen a, a bit, of, bit of a dip in the lamb production and slaughter in the last year. So these are MLA numbers showing sheep uh, lamb production in tons and then the sheep inventory as the yellow line there. Uh, the, the shaded areas, uh, and I'll see if I can work this, um, the shaded areas that we've got going up here, these are the MLA projections on where they expect lamb production to go over the next five years from 2018. So, they're expecting slaughter this year to pick up by about 2% and looking at about 22.95 um, uh, in, in terms of the uh, million sheep, a million lambs slaughtered. Um, that's not far off the record in terms of our total number of lambs slaughtered. 2019, they're expecting a bit of a dip and they've revised these numbers just recently. So they're expecting slaughter to drop by just under 1% uh, next year before increasing again to to reach a record of about 23 million heads slaughtered uh, out in 2020. So uh, a fairly consistent or steady growth rate there for, for slaughter after what they're expecting is a bit of a dip at the moment uh, off the back of the current dry conditions that we've got and uh, some increased sales that we've got at the moment that will obviously flow through to the ability from, from the flock's point of view to, to generate the lambs for next year. So. With, with slaughter number, those slaughter numbers in mind, they're also forecasting that our slaughter weights are going to pick up by about 1% and I'm going to touch on that in a minute because I think that's an interesting question for the industry and where we sit as a, a lamb producing nation that has one, a big domestic market, but then two, quite a diverse range of export markets. Um, I, I think as a lamb producer, there's probably going to be a case of, you know, the, the market or the or the uh, the supply chain that you're selling into is going to become uh, one where you you have to be a little bit more selective in, in terms of what you're trying to target. I'll touch on those slaughter weights in a minute, but with with that expected slight increase in slaughter weight and the slaughter numbers that they're predict, predicting, we're, we're going to see the total total production for 2018 pick up by about 3%, their forecast is for 2019 and then out to 2022, we'll see up here, up around that 550,000 tonnes, which is uh, will be a record in terms of any sort of land production that we've got in Australia. Looking at the, uh, the the sheep inventory line here, and we can all see, and, and you're fully aware in terms of what's happened in terms of the national flock, it's it's decreased for a number of years up to 2010 and, and has since stabilised. They're expecting that to increase a little now. This is an interesting conversation that I'm having currently with George and my colleague who looks after our, our wool commodity forecasting and trying to get an understanding on that sheep complex with both positive and, and uh, very favourable land prices, but also with the very favourable wool testing that I marked recently for wool, uh, a new record from a nominal point of view. So uh, it's it's a question as to, well, what's going to drive some of the growth in the Australian sheep flock? And with strong prices for, for lamb and sheep meat at the moment, there's obviously a, a motivation to, to continue to turn off sheep rather than to hold them back for wool production. So that's something that we're looking at at the moment and in the next, uh, where are we up, June, we're looking at about August, September of releasing something on, on what's going to happen in terms of that demand side um, and what might flow through in terms of the Australian flock. So that, that wool uh, sheep meat interaction will be an interesting one that will, will determine some of those, those flock numbers and ultimately the, the ability to, to, uh, to increase production. I said I'd, uh, I'd touch on, on slaughter weights and I'll just park that over here. Um, this is an interesting thing that I, I started looking at last year and, and basically you can see Australian slaughter weights have been ticking along. Now, it doesn't look like they've actually increased much and you can see when I put a trend line over the last 10 years, it's, it's, it hasn't been huge. Um, but over the last 10 years, we've got about a 9% increase in our slaughter weights and we're averaging now 
up around about that 23 kilo mark. If you compare that to New Zealand, for example, their slaughter weights have been a lot flatter um, and it's very hard to tell with the numbers there, but over the last 10 years, they've, they've increased at 8%. But if we look in the last five years, um, Australia's slaughter weights have continued to increase and we increased by about 2%, whereas New Zealand had stabilised and actually declined. Their slaughter weights dropped by 2%. Uh, over the last five years. So they're much more stable in terms of what type of product they're producing. Now, just to give you a bit of a shock, I thought I'd put on there the US slaughter weights uh, and they're way out there. Now, I think this is the interesting thing because we start looking at what you're producing, what market you're actually selling to, that US slaughter weight becomes uh, a factor worth considering because as I'll touch on in a minute, when we look at our exports, if we're exporting increasing volumes to the US and that's what they're considering a normal sheep, uh, normal lamb in the US to be, uh, granted they don't have a lot of them, uh, but that's the type of product that they're used to over there, are we gonna continue to see our slaughter weights increase? And if you look at the grid prices that you get these days, and, and I, I've, I've seen a couple of them, but the, the price that you receive for a, uh, a 22, 23 kilo lamb compared to say a 25, 26 kilo lamb, by the time you you, uh, you multiply the cents per kilo out across the, the actual weight of the animal, there's not really much of a discount for producing a heavier product. So there's definitely a demand for it or, or there's not that that huge penalty for producing large, large lambs. The question is, uh, is it in our best interest to actually continue to push towards that larger animal or should we maintain something a little bit more in line with what New Zealand's doing? Granted, there are slightly different export markets at play here. Oh, I can't see it in the corner there, but I think that's just showing the increases. Um, yep the increases that we've seen over the last uh, last five years. So we've seen the US slaughter weights come down 7%, New Zealand's go down two and Australians go up 2%. So just touching or turning to prices then, and you're all very very well aware, no doubt, on, on the, the very impressive uh, recent history of, of land prices in Australia. And I've marked here the heavy trade land price uh, through the uh, sale yards for New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia and Tasmania, just for those people in the different states to be able to, to see where those heavy trade lambs in the 20 to 22 kilo class are sitting. And as you can see, it's been a very steady increase over the last uh, five years. Um, the thing I wanted to point out here is that the last 12 months or last two years, we've been a lot less seasonal in those actual price fluctuations. Now, uh, I'd be keen if there's any discussion at the end, if people want to share any thoughts on, on that. But previously, you could be pretty certain that you'd have the standard peak in prices during the middle of the year when obviously supply is shorter. Then when the, uh, the, the spring lambs come on through October, November, December, the prices generally fall uh, and, and reach a low point in the season before returning to go back up again. As you can see for the 2017 figures there, um, you can actually, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to rearrange this so I can actually see it. You can see that the prices have been a lot more stable throughout the year. Now, price being the confluence between supply and demand, the question becomes, well, is this a supply issue or is it a demand issue? And we've seen, so to answer that question, I, I look at things like, well, what have our slaughter numbers been? And, and granted, national slaughter, slaughter numbers for November, December uh, were down. November's numbers year on year were down 3%. December numbers were down 15%. Um, New South Wales was a heavy contributor to that. Our, um, our slaughter numbers for October, November, December were down 11%, 11% and 14%. So year on year, the slaughter numbers were a, a lot shorter during that, that latter part, so that late 2017, when you'd normally expect the prices to dip down here, um, they stayed a lot more, a lot, uh, more constant and, and probably as a result of some of that uh, reduced supply on the market. But we've since seen the supply start to pick up again. So question is, will the prices now see a bit of a delayed drop? Um, I don't think so. Uh, April slaughter numbers are up 24% compared to last year. So they're those dry conditions coming through and people shedding some more sheep. 
the other side of the question is, well, what about the demand side of it? And this, I think, has probably been just as much of the cause as those supplier shortages. And we've seen very strong exports um, through the latter part of last year. So our exports were up again year on year uh, in October, November. They did drop a little bit in December. Um, but we've had very strong markets with the Middle East and China, both up between you know, 10 to 30% uh, in 2017 um, for the last three months of 2017, sorry. So we, when you compare the, the October, November, December months in 2017 to the same months in 2016, um, exports to the Middle East and China were up uh, by 10 to 30%. So some very strong demand in those markets um, which, which is encouraging, I think, because normally you'd look at a, an increasing supply like we've seen in the lamb industry, uh, and you'd expect at some point you'll reach that, that tipping point where the supply equals demand and our prices will come up, come off. But the indications are at this stage with those prices that, that there is still favorable demand out there that's supporting this growth in supply. So it gives us a lot of encouragement for, for, the, for the next couple of years ahead. One thing to bear in mind though, and this is starting to look where, you're, uh, where you market your actual product through to, is well, what's, what's that in comparison to say, uh, or if we're selling on the domestic market, how does that sit with other proteins? Because at the end of the day, the consumer's going into the shop, they're looking down, they're walking down the meat cabinets and they're saying, what am I gonna have for dinner? Um, I'd like some protein in the middle of my plate, what's it gonna be? Um, I'm an Australian, you know, red meat's high, high focus, but there are a whole lot of other competing products in there with, with chicken and pork. So this is what's going on at the moment in terms of the actual live stock prices. So these are land prices. It's the same graph as before on a shorter time frame. Um, you can see the seasonality, but it's ticking along and it's ticking along very healthily above that six, $6 a kilo mark. You put beef cattle prices over the top of that and you can see they reached their peak at the end of 2016 there over seven seven dollars a kilo this is the um Eki, the eastern um uh, young cattle indicator uh, so it's reached its peak in 2000 late 2016 through 2017 it started to, to come off it found a little bit of life at the end of 2017 but it's since come back again and we're now uh, under that five dollars a kilo mark so it's starting to come down uh, goat prices, not that I expect many Australian consumers to be eating goat, but it fell over the edge of a cliff in 2017 there as well. Um, really had a big correction in goat prices. And then the other one that's probably of more interest is pig prices. Now I don't have uh, this time series all the way to the end um, for pig prices, but at the moment they're, they're trading at about $2.80. So they've dipped dipped again a little bit. They started to improve towards the end of last year, standard, I suppose, as it in increases in towards Christmas, but um, they've dipped again this year. So the theme is that basically we've got land prices that are holding strong in a with an upward trend. And yet we've got all the other proteins that are being sold on that supermarket shelf that have either had a correction and are now steady, or in the case of beef prices, probably uh, or possibly could come down a little bit further. So. The question is, how's that competitiveness on that on that retail um, shelf? And it's something that, that's worth considering when the, the supermarkets are trying to promote their product. That being said though, uh, um, if you look at the actual margin between, or oh, sorry, so you didn't look at retail prices and you can see, we haven't actually seen the same trend in the retail prices that we've seen in the livestock prices. Retail, retail prices for beef, um, for the, the change in retail prices between the December quarter last year and the March quarter this year, beef has actually gone up 2%. So despite it sort of coming down a little bit, um, chicken's gone up 1%, lamb's gone up 4% and pork has gone down 2%. So that's the change quarter on quarter from the end of last year to the beginning of this year. Um, you'd expect there probably is a bit of room for the beef prices to come down on that retail show, um, cabinet. Um, the, the pork prices have already started their decline in terms of those retail prices. That being said though, and this is what I was going to say before, but the, the margin between lamb and beef prices at that retail uh, level is, is some of the highest levels it's been in 10 years, i.e. that beef prices are still commanding quite a margin over the top of lamb prices uh, on the retail side of things. So despite the livestock 
livestock price, lamb livestock price being one of the highest of the proteins, um, the retail price is actually showing that that it's still trading at a, at, at quite a, a discount to beef prices. So while livestock prices are suggesting that maybe it has to come down a little bit to be competitive, at the retail end, the, the, the retailers and, and everyone else in the supply chain are obviously doing a wonderful job um, at either inflating the beef prices or keeping the land prices under control. So really when it puts it in comparison uh, to, to say, well, to provide that consumer with the choice when they go into the supermarket and say, what am I gonna buy? Am I gonna buy beef or lamb? Um, you know, there's still quite a, a, a margin for the beef prices. So there's, there's a degree of comfort with that as well in terms of land prices and not seeing much pressure from the retail end. Turning the export markets now, and I always like to put this up because it gives us a bit of an idea of the context and the size of the markets. Um, I'll focus on exports, but it's always interesting to see the lime green lines here uh, are the equivalent carcass weight uh, volume of lamb that's sold in our supermarkets. And then the red ones are the ones that are sold in the, the special retail source, so the, the butchers and the like. So you put that into context with say our major export markets being the Middle East in yellow, China being brown, uh, US in blue and then other in, in purple, oh sorry, EU in purple and then other in, in green. And you can just see how important that domestic trade is. Um, still, you know, making up close to half of the, the lamb sold. The things I wanted to point out here on this on this export chart and just quickly turn it to some of the export markets is um, is I suppose working through them the Middle East we'll, we'll look at that for, for a start and and it's seen some pretty steady growth and it's it's generally been a very good strong market for us so up until 2015 it's seen some strong growth 2016 it started to ease back and um, and then 2017 it picked up again a little bit three percent up uh, last year, but it did actually suffer a 10% fall in 2016. Now, there might be a couple of reasons for that. Bahrain reduced the import subsidy program they had, so they, they actually, the government there subsidised imports of lamb. Uh, they removed that and that meant that a market that was well over 10,000 tonnes suddenly became a market of 650 tonnes last year. So that's probably a reason for that Middle Eastern market um, adjustment there in 2016. So one thing to watch with that Middle East market, while it's a very good and um, steady market for us, there is a heavy reliance on government support programs in a number of those major markets. Uh, and oil prices tend to have an influence on the ability or the availability of government funds to spend on those programs. So um, it's just one to keep an eye on in terms of the influences outside the scope of what would, would, would be considered sort of the, the traditional land trade. Um, the other one to, to note in this export graph here is is China, and we've seen China actually. You know, China's been there's been a lot said about China, uh, but it's generally sort of tacked along 2012 to 2015 at about that just under that 40 or around that 40,000 mark. It started to pick up in uh, 2016, and then 2017 uh, we've seen some good growth, and um, we saw a 24% increase year on year, which is which is positive uh, from that China market now. I do hold a little bit of caution with China because we have seen it fluctuate quite a lot from year to year, um, but uh, it appears at the moment this is some steady good growth. They have had some reduction in their own domestic supplies with some drought in Inner Mongolia, which caused their own supply to shrink a little bit. We thought that might have contributed to some of the growth, but the the, uh, the actual import demand is, is continuing to hold strong. So um, that's encouraging from China's point of view. The US is the one that I'd really like to talk about, and I know that I'm up to, to 20 minutes already, so I'll just quickly flick through it. But really the US, uh, if we look at that blue line there, and it's continued to grow, and it's been growing strongly and steadily for the last uh, five to six years. Not not at the same massive rates that say China fluctuates at, but you know, we're going sort of around the five to five to ten percent growth year on year, which is encouraging from the US point of uh, from the Australian point of view and I think it's particularly important when you look at this graph so this is the actual um, per unit value of exports that we send to the different markets and pulled out those four key markets again for Australia so while everyone talks about China and how important it is it's one of our lowest paying markets per unit of export so uh, while it takes a lot of volume they're not going to set prices um, the UAE is, is generally pretty good and is the United Kingdom uh, generally pretty good markets. But the important one is this red line here, the US market. 
And we can see that has been consistently higher than all the other markets and it's been pretty steady and strong uh, in that space as well. So that, that sends a, a very good signal to me and, and I suppose to answer the question that I posed at the beginning, what's driving the Australian land prices, I think that red line and coupled with the volume that we actually saw on the graph before is one of the real reasons why we see land prices where they are uh, at the moment. So just quickly on that US land market, and again, this is something that if uh, you tune into a podcast in the couple of coming months, I'm trying to delve into a little bit deeper. Unfortunately, we don't actually have a lamb analyst in the US. We have a beef analyst and a pork analyst, but lamb is such a very small part of their consumption over there. They, uh, they consume less, I think, than one pound per person per year, which equates to, uh, to less than 500 grams. It's one serving, basically, that everyone has per year. Um, but the encouraging thing I think from the US point of view for an Australian export market is that we've seen that US domestic production of lamb decline very steadily over the last oh, long 30, 40 years. Um, exports aren't really an important part for, for the US, they trade a little bit with Mexico. But more recently that orange line, the imports there, they, the imports have made up and particularly here where we see the, the volume, this is total consumption I suppose when you, you add it all together. The, the, the consumption's actually started to pick up. So uh, encouragingly, the imports are filling that gap. Now that's pretty much Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and I think that's a real story for the Australian lamb industry. The question is though, when you look at that lamb market in the US, traditionally it's been the Hispanic um, uh, sort of African American consumers of lamb, which would would probably put it in the in the basket of, well, it's, it's a more a, more a staple product for them. But I think the US market has got a lot of opportunity for Australia because the consumer over there is used to eating red meat. And if you can actually sell lamb like you've sold it in Australia and changed it from being a, a low, um, low cost sort of commodity red meat protein support source to a high value mark, um, product like we have in Australia, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that US market. So. Um, that that's very encouraging and I think the fact that we're growing in that market and and really um, we, we're doing it single-handedly while New Zealand does su supply some into the um, US market as this next graph will show it's not very important for them so quickly looking at our competitor in New Zealand and some of you may be aware if you've got New Zealand contacts or seen or heard the news but New Zealand's gone through a big restructure in their agriculture over there with the, the very strong growth in dairy. So a lot of the sheep production has been pushed into more marginal areas and a lot of the sheep farms have actually been converted into dairy. So they've lost um, quite a bit of their capacity to actually grow lamb. And you can see uh, these are the New Zealand exports uh, from 2013 through to 2017. And you can see that they have actually declined. Um, they've declined by about 2.7%. Uh, well, they, they declined 2.7% last year. So um, they're expecting those exports to remain fairly steady this year. They've seen a bit of a correction uh, and a halt in that decline, but um, their sheep population's been declining um, and their total production has been declining. And as a result, exports have come down too. They, they export the majority of their product. Uh, they, don't, they only have a very small domestic market compared to the volume that they produce. So, as a competitor, I suppose, um, you know, they're, they're always one you've got to keep an eye on, but encouragingly for the Australian sheep producer, it's not like New Zealand is, is taking off in leaps and bounds at the moment. They're very uh, steady in their actual production and exports. The interesting that will flow out of it is um, what happens with uh, the EU and uh, the Brexit process and, and whether or not we regain or get any increased access. New Zealand's got a much bigger quota into uh, the EU at the moment than we do and with UK separating out of uh, that European quota, are they gonna start their own separate quota or, or how are those arrangements gonna change? So the opportunity for us to actually gain some more share in Europe uh, might be a good one given it is a high value market. Um, but you look at this, this distribution of uh, New Zealand exports to the major countries and you can see China is is one of their keys uh, and Europe is their other one. Um, they haven't got a lot of growth into that Europe, uh, that US market. Maybe it's because the product that they're trying to sell is not actually the, the, the type of product that they're looking for in the US. 
So in summary then, and very quickly and happy to pick up on any points of discussion afterwards, but from our point uh, within Rabobank, we think production is going to continue to increase. Um, we're going to have more clarity on that in the coming months as we start to do a bit more research on that, that global demand picture and then some of the drivers locally. Uh, but at the moment, I don't see any reason why MLA's forecasts uh, would be incorrect. Uh, exports are looking favourable. Um, you know, we've got good strong markets, good diverse markets, but we need to consider the market that we're producing for. Uh, as I said, you know, we, we saw that that carcass value for the US or the carcass weight for the US much higher than what we're producing here. It's a much different product. It's what they're used to. Uh, but then interestingly, anecdotally, our um, US beef analyst was out here at the beginning of May and I asked him, you know, what does he eat for his standard dinner? And he said, oh, beef, beef, beef. And I said, do you ever eat lamb? And he said, well, sometimes, not very often though, but I'll eat lamb when I come to Australia or New Zealand because it's much nicer than the lamb we've got in the US. So that just sort of twigged a little question in my mind to say, well, should we actually aspire to produce that massive lamb that they do in the US or are we actually better to create our own product in our own niche um, without overfeeding the land to create a, a product that, that may only be suitable for that US consumer given and given that we actually supply a range of different markets including our domestic market um, should we be a little bit conservative in the growth that we're looking for in our land. Um, New Zealand production is going to be steady. They're not looking at any great, great increase in, in lamb uh, production. Their sheep numbers are pretty much contained in terms of the land, that the land they've got available to grow sheep. And overall, prices are looking favourable to remain strong from our point. I can't see any reason why the, the prices would fall at the moment. We're, we're still you know, in dry conditions, turning out larger volumes of slaughter. Uh, sheep, um, both use um, or older sheep and, and lambs, and yet our prices continue to remain, remain strong. So it's, to me, that's a, that's a good story for, for the demand side of the equation and, and ultimately a good story longer term in terms of that demand for, for lamb. So that's, that's a brief summary, and uh, I think I've well and truly used my time, but happy to take any questions uh, fr from anyone uh, on, on what has been presented or anything else that might be of interest. Great, thank you, Angus. Um, great presentation, um, very concise and to the point, and you covered a very wide and um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a very wide topic area, and uh, I think you've done well to cover as much as you have in the time that you had available to. Um, Angus, I'll give you a rest there for a minute or two. I'm just going to give next week's webinar a quick mention. We've got. Uh, Phil Graham, a, a very experienced and respected pasture agronomist from up, uh, you know, in the uh, southwest slopes or the southern tablelands, pre presenting to uh, to our audience on what we can expect with regards to pasture growth uh, this winter. So it's been a, a big question on everyone's lips. Um, had a really tough uh, autumn, and very little or next to no pasture wedge coming into winter. We have people approaching lambing and uh, quite often eroded body condition scores, uh, no residual dry matter and very little green shoot. So Phil's uh, very, uh, very, uh, very well researched and very experienced in this space. He'll be able to provide us with some indication of what we can expect with regards to pasture growth over the next two or three months. Uh, what this will mean for our for our prime land flocks, and also what strategies we may be able to, uh, or grazing management strategy we, we may be able to implement to ensure that we get the most out of our grazing potential and, and hopefully reduce our supplementary feeding costs a little bit. So that's next week, next Wednesday, June 30, at the same time, same place, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So please uh, keep an eye on your emails and text messages for reminders about that, and we'll be uh, filling in with more detail as that day approaches. Phil Graham, next Wednesday, June the 20th. So Angus has provided us his contact details there. Thank you, Angus, and some great resources. Check out the Rabo Research uh, website and also the Rabo podcasts. Um, there's other information available. Don't forget to check out the Making More From Sheep website. And MLA do have quite a, 
advanced interactive market research tool on their website. I use it occasionally to see where everything's at. Um, jump on uh, on the MLA website and check that out. You can dial in a whole range of variables, what, you, what you're looking for, and it'll produce, uh, you know, historical, goes back a few years, uh, prices, and also the current market prices. So I encourage you to have a look at that. Angus, um, a few questions coming through here, and uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get started. Angus, there's a question here from Neil. Um, uh, Neil asks, uh, what effect will the high grain prices have on the profitability of lamb feedlots and the amount of lambs fed onto higher weights? Uh, I don't know if you have a, a comment on that. Yeah, it's a very good question. And obviously feed grain prices are having an impact across the board for all uh, livestock industries that are actually using it as a, um, a as a means of, of gaining weight now, obviously beef feed lighting and, and dairy guys and, and pork and poultry. Um, oh, I, I haven't done the sums to actually know that the, uh, the, the margins in there at the moment, but I would suspect with the prices where they are and where they're going, uh, the, the challenge is going to be getting feeder lambs that are going to be cheap enough to be able to offset any gain in that, that feed grain price and selling it into a market. I, I, my thoughts um, generally in terms of that lamb feedlot situation is that you've got to have your finger on the pulse very closely and there's not a lot of room for, for, for error. So uh, the, the challenge will be for those that are using it as a form of, of finishing um, how you manage that input price from a, a lamb point of view because we you look at the different classes of lambs and 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 you know generally the the restocker or the merino lambs tend to trade at a bit of a discount but we've seen recently those prices hold up fairly firmly too so um, the only thing might that might help in that situation might be that if there's slightly less demand for those younger um, restocker lambs that that might offset some of that gain in grain prices but I would think where where grain prices are in the direction they're heading, that that margin's obviously going to be squeezed. Thanks, Angus. Uh, good question here from Nicole. Uh, Nicole joins us from Queensland, I think. Um, thanks for coming on board, Nicole. Her question revolves around those high uh, slaughter weights in the US. She asked, "What what is it? What is influencing the slaughter weights in the US? Um, is it the breed, or if not, you know, how are they getting so big? Uh, are you familiar with that, Angus? Yeah, it's a good question, and I mean, the majority. Well, breed does play a factor, uh, but the US system over there is is very different to the Australian system." Them where it is effectively a feed-based system, very, very similar to the way they run their cattle. So they'll have uh, the breeder herds out there or the breeder flocks out there with that that have a ewe lamb uh, scenario, but then those lambs, once they reach a, a certain age, will be going into a feedlot type operation and they'll all be grown um, on, on feed, or well, the majority of the lambs there are grown on feed. So um, that availability of cheap feed, which is effectively corn-based uh, feed ration, just means that they've got that ability to increase the, the, the weights on those lambs. So um, it, it's not limited as such, um, like the same situation in Australia where we're, we're much more constrained in terms of pasture availability. Um, it's probably also a little bit of the US um, uh, way of doing things too, that they like to do things big. I know, you know, you compare Australia's uh, cattle weights to the US cattle weights, uh, slaughter weights, and our ours is, our slaughter, average slaughter weight has just reached 300 kilos, whereas the US continue to produce something that's 380 kilos. They actually produced something that was 415 kilos a couple of years ago. So um, bigger is better is sometimes a bit of a mantra in the US as well. So um, that's uh, that's my understanding as to how it's got there. But as I said, I'm I'm currently trying to track down someone in the US that can give us a better understanding on that, the the dynamics of that US system over there. 
as I said, unfortunately, we don't have a sheep meat analyst that covers the US. We have a beef analyst. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to find some of our regional bankers that are based in sheep producing country that and, and speaking to some of their clients to better understand their production systems over there. But uh, yeah, the short answer is that yeah, genetic has something to do with it, but it's probably more more the fact that they just feed all their sheep or all their lambs uh, in a feedlot system. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'll just make a comment. Um, there's a few people that may need to duck off for the evening, and I appreciate that if you do have to, i uh, just remind everyone to participate in the uh, post-webinar survey. We do rely heavily on those post-webinar surveys to guide us in our decision-making around the webinars. So it only takes two minutes. Uh, drop uh, drop a few comments in there and um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to tidy that up and provide that to MLA and, and also Angus this evening so that they can assess how the presentation has gone. Uh, Angus, is another question from Nicole. Um, why the very large drop in goat prices? Yeah, another, another good question. The explanation that I got for that drop in goat prices last year was that there were a number of abattoirs using goats to actually fill out their kill sheets for the week so um, when sheep numbers became scarce they were actually starting to, to delve into the, the goat slaughter and, and and send some of them off to to export markets and as a result um, with a, a, a yeah, well with, with the supply situation for goats that that helped push goat prices up um, and then they reached the point where they just decided that they actually had too much goat in storage and they, they couldn't sell as much anymore, so they effectively backed right out of it. Um, that was one of the explanations uh, that I had. Um, I, I can't really see anything else that, that has actually caused it to drop or correct in, in such a fashion. And it has been a very strong growth and very steady growth for a number of years, um, and, and that's partly due to the growth in export demand. but. Um, I, I think it was probably more a case of um, that dynamic in the process or the, the abattoir demand here and then suddenly the, the no longer that, that need or, or I suppose more a realisation that they actually had quite a lot of goat in storage um, and that they would have to find a market for it that they, uh, they effectively stopped, stopped killing it and stopped demanding it through the sale yard. So um, that, that's my understanding of why that correction occurred. Okay, thanks Angus. Um, Frank, I uh, got your question there. Thank you, Frank. Um, I just need to interpret a little bit. Uh, can we see, or, or, can we start to see the difference published in prices paid for short wools and the increasing hair breed numbers for both domestic and exports? Uh, Angus, you might interpret that yourself, but I think uh, I think Frank's asking, um, are we seeing a you know any or have is there any way in which we can see any increase in and in, say the the hair breeds i.e. I Dorpers, Damaras and the like uh, you know increasing in popularity in the domestic and export market. Uh, in terms of the production for from meat production in Australia's overall flock. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I think, and, and I don't have the numbers to hand at the moment, um, but yes, there is a there is an ability or a way in which you can actually separate out. Uh, I have seen the numbers speaking with Georgia, our wool analyst, as to the flock composition to know, you know, how many merinos, how many first cross, and and the other hair breeds as well to to see that split. Um, uh, now. I'm relying on my memory here, but from from memory, there there had been a trend towards those other, um, yeah, I suppose hair breeds, dorpers, etc. Um, that you could see in those numbers, but m more recently, um, it, it's it's cor not corrected, but it's it's effectively sort of plateaued a little bit. We we haven't been the same growth in the last couple of years um, from memory on those numbers. So uh, I, I think the fact that we've seen such improvement in wool prices is now meaning that, that the operators are, are considering what's their, um, you know, what's their operational mix and, and can they actually 
get a very good wool clip out of a merino ewe or a, um, yeah, a, a merino lamb or a first cross lamb um, and then sell it for meat as well and be able to get some uh, some value out of it for, for two things. So I think that has probably in the last couple of years meant that we've seen that increased volume of, of hair bred sheep in the total flock sort of stabilise rather than continue to increase. Yeah, no, that's that's spot on, Angus, and I, 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 I suspect that as well. I, so the Dorpers got a real foothold back when uh, the Merinos were not uh, a favourable enterprise, but um, it's very hard to compete with a with a, a dual purpose Merino operation or a first cross year operation when wool selling for you know anywhere between twelve and twenty five dollars a kilo, and um, the Dorpers. Uh, you know they have to compete with that, and and um, and that also they don't have uh, years of of genetic progress towards the fast finishing uh, low fat animal that we have in the, in the Dorsets and the Border Leicesters and the White Suffolks that, that we see today. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how those short or the the hair breeds progress in the market. And we can only we might have to revisit this conversation in, in five or ten years' time. Um, I, I think so, and that's 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 one thing we, we're trying to um, trying to get our handle on, I suppose, in in the work we're doing at the moment to to get an idea what's what's the actual Australian sheep flock looking like in in five years' time. Is you know are, are those um, air breeds going to actually continue to increase, um, or are they going to revive their increase, or are we going to see that you know with with strong steady wool prices, the the tendencies to to try and maintain that merino or that wool production side of things and, and just uh, fill the frame out on some of those merino lambs. Uh, Angus, um, Tony Brennan asked a question here, Did, do your figures include the live trade? So do your exports include uh, live trade lambs or or, or maybe it doesn't, uh, maybe uh, we don't actually send lambs and, into the live trade, we just send adult sheep, don't we? Uh, predominantly adult sheep, yes, but no, the, the numbers don't include live trade animals. It's just simply the boxed uh, box trade that are sent for export. Live live sheep export accounts for about 2 million head compared to the, I think it was about 25, 24, 25 million um, or 23 million head slaughtered. So uh, it's a 6%, I think, of, of total sheep slaughter or, or total sheep to leave farm for slaughter or, or live trade is, is about six percent live yeah okay let's put on um yeah so oh, steve thanks us steve uh, thank you very much thank you angus and david great webinar thank you steve uh, a good um a good comment here from one of our participants, uh, US lambs are a fair bit older at slaughter than our lambs, and they also have a different lamb classification system. So thanks for that. That uh, all gives context to why those US uh, slaughter weights were, were so high. Um, thanks, Nicole. Thanks, David and, and Angus. Great webinar and a great speaker. Well done. Uh, Brad asks, does the data reflect uh, South Australia? Um, uh, there were a few state or, or state-based uh, data presented uh, tonight. Angus, were, was South Australia, um, uh, you know, in that mix, or do they ref is it reflective of the South Australian data as well? Um, I'll just see. Can I? Am I still? I'm not sure. Am I still sharing my screen, David? I'll just go back. That's fine. Yeah. Um, just flip back to wherever you need to go. Yep. So domestic prices, no, I haven't got South Australian prices on that one. Um, I think that was the main one. That's, I think that is the, uh, I think that's the only one. Yep. Yep. And that's my mistake. I should have put South Australia on there, but it, it, it follow a similar trend. I, I suspect the question might be around possibly the, the closure of the TFI uh, Murray Bridge plant and whether or not that had any impact. Uh, we have seen um, uh, the, the cattle numbers change, but not so in terms of slaughter numbers out of South Australia, but less so from a sheep point and probably because TFI being able to ship some of their sheep to Lebethal. Um And from the producers I speak to in South Australia, the TFI um, fire 
didn't appear to have any sort of um, medium to long term effects. It's sort of, it was maybe a disruption for a week or two as things started had to be reorganised, but otherwise the, the, the market seemed to progress well. And, um, and I think you know when you look at the Australian market at the moment, um, South Australia is probably in a slightly more favourable position than some of the areas in New South Wales and Victoria that have had a lot drier seasons too. Interesting. That's an interesting time series data there, Angus. You can see how Western Australia and Tasmania normally lag uh, that curve, whereas Victoria always seems to be out in front on the price movement, on a seasonal price movement. And no doubt it's reflective of, of some aspect of their seasonality. Um, a question here from uh, Frank. Uh, can the can producers access the prices being paid at the sale yards uh, or in the regional uh, sale yards? I'll make a quick comment and then on that, Gus. I think on the MLA website, if you do look there, Frank, you can tease out um, different uh, classes of livestock sold either in the sale yards or, or over the hook, um, and you can choose your different sale yards there. So uh, I, I'm quite certain that that's possible. Have you got any further comment there, Angus? Yeah, that's that's right. They have a, um, a short to medium term sale yard reporting uh, program or, or page on their website that allows you to, as David said, you know, select you can select the individual sale yard, you can select the uh, class of animal, the weight of animal, um, and you can get numbers sold and price per head and price per kilo. Uh, it gives you three years of historical information and it's effectively updated on a weekly basis when MLA collect their sale yard reporting information through uh, each week. Uh, most, or oh yeah, most ma major sale yards are, are listed there. Um, the other thing is that MLA does have a database of information if you're looking for more historical figures such as that one on the slide there where they do provide national and state based <coughs> sorry excuse me state based prices but they don't then break it down into individual sale yards um, and they only do it by they more effectively do it by weight range uh, so category of animals so you I think it's an 18 to 20, 20 to 22, and 20 to 22 to 24, and 24 and above weight range for, for lambs. Excellent. Right. Thank you, Angus. Um, well, a good question here from Chris, um, quite topical. Is mulesing an issue in the lamb trade, especially with more and more merino lambs going into that trade? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's not something that I've come across before. Um, <laughs> possibly because you're eating the meat and maybe that's just as much a question as to whether or not it's mules or not. But it doesn't seem to have got its traction, got the same amount of traction in, in, I suppose, meat marketing compared to what it has in wool. Uh, that being said though, Animal welfare and a lot of those social pressures, I think, are just going to continue to add, add up. And industry, or all, all the livestock industries, really have, have have got to really try and uh, consider what what actions or, or operations they conduct that may raise some questions and and see you know be be proactive in trying to either address them or get ahead of the curve because I think those sorts the things are only going to going to increase and, and and realistically if you look at it in a pragmatic sense you you know mulesing uh, sheep for a wool producing system you know they're, they're still going into a meat trade anyway and if you're against mulesing it you're against mulesing it doesn't it, to me if you are holding that um, uh, that ethical position of saying we don't want mulesing anymore then it it, um, it, it surely should throw, flow through for, for any sheep producer. But um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be the same pressure. You know, for example, and the wool, wool guys have their, um, uh, they call it no known, no, no, no mulesing, or they, they can tick the box that, that allows them to sell it as non mules wool. Um, you know, potentially, it, it could be the case that you might see that 
that lamb or, or mutton turns up on the shelf saying from non non mules to sheep. Um, as I said I haven't heard or seen or, or um, no one said anything like that to me, but I think you know as an industry it's probably something that that um, you know, we need to be cognizant of and, um, and and try and be proactive on that up front. Mm. Thanks, Angus. So I, I would imagine um, um, that most most merino systems that are producing or trying to bring their weather lambs up to speed quickly enough to sell them as lambs, it'd be uh, it'd be quite a few of them wouldn't actually be mulesing, I'd imagine. Um, but there's always that instance where um, you know weather lambs and just isn't uh, you know strategies change so mules uh, animals may make it on to the uh, into the market uh, as, a, as a lamb or uh, for, fit for um, you know, human consumption so yeah great question thanks Chris um, there's no other questions uh, just at the moment here Gus uh, we got some positive sentiment here thanks so much Neil well done Angus great roundup of export and domestic markets great presentation also some positive uh, some positive uh, messages from from other uh, participants there. So I'll just take the opportunity to plug next week web next week's webinar again uh, Wednesday evening on um, June 20. We've got Bill Graham presenting on what we can expect of pasture growth and some strategy, uh, grazing management strategies over over the coming winter. Uh, really topical and really important as as producers uh, looking to get lambs on the ground, uh, looking to get lamb survival and to uh, to kick off lactation uh, to get out to get the growth rates up and, and, and the lambs off before the decline in partial quality uh, at the end of the growing season so jump on board there it should be a really good webinar uh, feels very uh, very apt at that space and a very direct uh, clear and, and precise presenter so really looking forward to that Gus is in, um, seems to have uh, ended our questions sessions so uh, I might take the opportunity to thank you very much for being on board with MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinars. No, not a problem, David. Um, it's been great to be able to, to to participate in this and and some really good questions and discussion afterwards, which is which is great. It's always a little bit more difficult when you're doing it via um, the the electronic means, but hopefully everyone got something out of it. And um, thank you very much for having me. No, our pleasure, and we'll be in touch over the next day or two with um, some follow-up uh, follow results on the webinar and provide you with a record and all that sort of stuff. So I'll, um, when, you get a, when you get a space over the next few days, you can check your emails. It should all be there, and we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks also to the participants tonight and for MLA uh, for throwing the webinar. Uh, we couldn't do it without them, and we couldn't do it without you. So keep coming to these live events and participating in the Q&A session. Um, we're looking forward to having you on board at future webinars. So keep an eye on your emails and your text messages and we'll be in touch as soon as possible. Have a good evening.